If you've interpreted seismic data, you've probably been looking at sections that look uh, something like this, where you have, um, here we can see the wiggly, what we call wiggly traces. They wiggle or go back and forth, and they're often referred to as variable area wiggly trace because the uh, positive cycles are often colored in black and the negative cycles are left uncolored. Over here we have a synthetic which doesn't provide too good of a match but you can see positive and a negative here. This positive doesn't quite line up uh, negative and then another positive here. And of course the synthetic is put together from the, as you remember from our convolutional model, we have a wavelet, we have density, we have velocity, we have reflection coefficients, and, and we go through that re convolution process in order to get this uh, synthetic seismogram, and it may be a good match sometimes, and maybe it's not. And there are a variety of reasons for that, uh, including amplitude variation with offset, the um, Fresnel zone effects, and so on. These are, uh, this would be land data. This is marine data. Here you can see the water column. This would be a water bottom reflection. Seeing the sea floor here. And you can see where the interpreter has marked off various uh, intervals. Uh, they've been able to identify and correlate. And here you can see that the interpreter has tried to correlate some reflections, uh, not too successfully through this area, a little bit more successfully down here, but you can see where the automatic cycle picking of the computer can get off track sometimes, and so this, uh, instead of correlating up here, may correlate with this reflection event here. This reflection event, the computer found it, found it pretty easy to correlate across the section. So this is typical uh, processed seismic data that you may have seen before. And um, when we're looking at seismic data, we're often thinking about the frequency content. Most of the seismic data that you look at is going to have frequency content in the range of about 10 to um, uh, 120 hertz. And over here, this is a um, interesting website that you may want to stop and have a look at. We'll go ahead and take a look at this uh, site here. And what, what you can see is uh, the lowest human threshold of hearing, around 16 to 32 hertz. So we're getting into the seismic d domain here, the lower part of the seismic domain. Uh, bass, uh, 32 to 512. Human speech, 512 hertz to 2048. Uh, presence to speech, um, so on and so forth. We're in that frequency range. This is the lowest organ note, 8 hertz. Um, Lowest note for a tuba, large pipe organs, 16.35 hertz. Lowest C on a standard 88 key piano. I can't hear it. Lowest note for a cello, 65 hertz. Let's see. I definitely can hear that. Uh, not sure if that comes across for you. Lowest note for the viola and the mandola. At 130 hertz. And then a middle C, 261. This would be the upper end of a 2 millisecond uh, uh, recording frequency. Certainly audible for most of us. And uh, the highest note for a flute. And so on. So th this may be a website that you you might want to uh, take a look at. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see these different uh, frequencies and to listen to them. But but we're usually in the uh, in the seismic domain. We're we're in this uh, uh, more or less 10 to um, 120 hertz range. 
The data are recorded with uh, geophones. This is a uh, typical geophone. Uh, you can see it's got a spike. You can. This uh, helps couple the geophone mechanism to the ground. Um, so we're recording ground vibrations. The uh, audible frequencies, again, for humans are more or less in this 20 to 10,000 hertz range. Um, highest note on a standard 88 key, key piano, 4200 hertz. We didn't play that one. Uh, seismic sections, again, um, usually in the 10 to 120 hertz range. And so here we're kind of looking inside the uh, geophone. And uh, you can see that the geophone has a magnet, fairly heavy. We've got a spring here. It's connected to a recorder. Uh, we've got this spike, so we've got good ground coupling here. The seismic waves shake the case up and down, so we've got these seismic waves coming in. They're shaking the case up and down. Now, remember these ground movements here are on the order of microns. So it's really small up and down motions. This magnet pretty much just sits still. It's got a lot of inertia. So this spring then vibrates up and down inside this magnetic field. We get a current that's generated, and that's the signal that we're recording. So when we record a signal, we have these, uh, we have two different uh, types of displays here. This is um, well, this is, of course, the variable area wiggly trace display where we're just seeing the positive and negative amplitudes kind of traced out as we have over here, except that the positive amplitude, the positive cycles are colored in. Over here we have a um, kind of a high resolution color image, and again the positive cycles are uh, colored in black and the negative cycles in varying uh, shades of, of, uh, of red, so we can see positive cycles, negative cycles, positive cycles. And this uh, color type display brings out features that uh, the interpreter finds very helpful. Sometimes I, I really like to come back to the variable area wiggly trace display just to see, in some cases, I'm, I, I can see the amplitudes uh, much better. Both types of displays are useful, but the data that you're looking at is basically sampled data. So we have a sample every, it could be four milliseconds, every two milliseconds, this would be your sample interval. You can see the ground move up and down. You could be measuring uh, pressure variations, uh, particle velocity, particle displacement. Um, and But basically we're measuring it at constant intervals of time, so we have a value here, a value here. We don't have values between. So we're kind of connecting them with a smooth line. Now, the type of recording system that is used is a digital recording system. And it's a, a base 2 recording system. So the amplitudes are stored in a binary code recorded in bits. And there are 8 bits per byte. And so this is one byte of data here. We have 8 bits. This is usually a sign bit for an 8-bit recording system. But the way we figure out what the number is, um, these are the powers of 2. And so that in our first bit here, we have 2 to the 0 power, which is 1. Here we have 2 to the 1 power, which is 2. Here we have 2 squared, or 4, 2 cubed, or 8. 2 to the 4th, or 16, and so on. So the on bits in the above record correspond to powers of 3, 2, and 0. So the number that we get is 2 to the 3rd plus 2 squared plus 2 to the 0, or 8 plus 4 plus 1. So this is this um, recording system uh, using uh, base 2. Um, recording is telling us that we have a number stored here that's equal to 13. This, this could be the amplitude of this particular sample or maybe this particular sample. But we'd have, uh, we'd have a 8 bits where we'd have one byte of data for each amplitude. 
And we're usually dealing with a sequential digital storage medium. So uh, as you're coming through time here at any particular sample, you'll have a particular sequence of uh, bits. This would be your sign bit. It happens to be on, so this is a positive number. And in this particular case, we have 2 to the 5th. 5 over here, 2 to the 4th, plus, I should have the plus signs in there, but 2, two to the 3rd uh, and 2 to the 0 power, so that gives us a 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 1, or 57. And that is just generally indicated as this, this number here in this sequence of digital numbers. So, um, it is worth, uh, if you've studied quantum mechanics, uh, flash memory, for example, takes advantage of quantum effects to reduce bit storage size down to potential wells, only a few nanometers inside, in size, in, inside oxide layers, so, which has made the amount of data you can store in a really small area, uh, really small part of the storage medium, immensely large. So. Um, our ability to, to store data in smaller and smaller uh, physical media has, has increased dramatic, dramatically as we begin to get down into this quantum world. And so the data that you record, you know, may look something like this, where you have, uh, this would be a one, two, three, four. So it would have a stepwise uh, appearance. This would be an 8-bit record. And uh, However, what you see in your seismic section is usually connected by a continuous line. So we get a nice, nice smoothly varying um, uh, waveform. Uh, as we look at the amplitudes that were recorded for each of these samples. Now, we've got sample number here. Remember that uh, the sample number corresponds to time. We need to know what the sample interval is in order to know what the time is. And also, we don't have decimals. So in this 8-bit recording system, we have uh, numbers that go from minus 128 to 127. And they're integer, uh, integer values. So dynamic range, uh, the system that you're using, will have um, a certain capability to record one byte of data, or two bytes, or uh, would be an 8-bit recording system or a 32-bit recording system. The 8-bit recording system, as we've seen, allows us to record numbers on the scale of minus 128 to 127. A 32-bit record allows us to store numbers in the range minus 2,147,483,648, that's 147,483,648. To uh, the positive end of this uh, value here. So we get dynamic range basically corresponds to the detail that we can record. In this case, we're recording over a t total interval of more than, you know, about four and a quarter billion. Uh, we could record that same signal just having uh, maybe 256 different numbers to work with. So obviously we're going to see a lot more detail in a 32-bit record than we are in an 8-bit record. So this has just been a simple introduction and we're going to discuss some, uh, we're going to go on to, to discuss some um, basic relationships between seismic wave velocities and elastic moduli. We've already touched on this quite a bit, so this would be a fairly brief um, discussion, and then we'll get uh, probably get into ray path theory uh, after that. Um, so anyway, we're, we're kind of starting out on taking a look at what seismic data is and uh, how we can relate it back to um, uh, you know, basic uh, mechanical properties and so on. So I appreciate your um, joining us, and hope you'll uh, stay with us next time.